Welcome to this installment of the Secretary Speaker Series and greetings from Cali, Colombia. We are smack dab in the middle of the UN Summit on Biodiversity, along with 25,000 other people from every corner of the planet. Cali, Colombia is Colombia's third most populous city, sitting at about 3,000 feet. I can tell you it's about 87 degrees with about 90% humidity here. And I'm watching people just suffer in their, in their business suits. So you're gonna see me sweat a lot over the last hour, but really excited to be here with you um, at this, this UN Summit on Biodiversity. And over the next 45, 50 minutes, I'm gonna introduce you to five remarkable leaders that's gonna shed light on just what's happening here. First, I wanna just wish you a very happy Native American Heritage Month. As you see the screen, uh, the slide on your screen, um, we celebrate Heritage Months across our administration and across the agency. And we will be celebrating in November Native American Heritage Month. Uh, as always, we'll be doing public dialogues, uh, in-person discussion, career panels, and I really hope you can join us. So I wanna share and introduce our first guest who is the Environment Minister of Sierra Leone, Chiwa Abdullahi. Uh, and Minister, first of all, thank you for spending time with us. You are a busy person. Uh, somehow you're managing to stay cool and not sweat like me in your suit. Um, and I, I, I'll note that you and I realized that we graduated from the same graduate school uh, the same year, so it's remarkable. But, but if you would, so tell us, you, know, you, are, you are representing the government of Sierra Leone in, in West Africa. Uh, you have a huge remit, a huge portfolio for your country, environment and climate change. What brings you here and what's your perspective on this UN summit? First of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, as Sierra Leone is a signatory to, to this uh, convention on biological diversity, so that's why we, we come here. And we come because a lot of these problems are real. Yeah. Um, and with fast cooperation and collaboration, uh, between governments, uh, between uh, civil society and NGOs. It's very difficult uh, to be able to address these problems. Uh, and you know, these gatherings create opportunities for us to come together to at least try to agree on ways forward to address uh, global problems uh, and then to collaborate with each other so that different countries bring different things to take. And the goal of the, the objective is to be able to solve uh, problems that affect humanity. Wow, and you're with 196 countries are only about 100 meters behind us in one of the largest rooms I've ever been in uh, negotiating. What's the dynamic? I mean, you're working across continents, regions. Uh, how, does it, how does it work to actually come together and, and work to find common ground? Uh, what, what, what we tend to see is many times people come here and understand these problems. Yeah. Um, but the challenge is how do they communicate with uh, when they go back to their capitals? Yeah. Uh, and the pressure is usually when we come out, we make commitments, but honoring those commitments becomes a challenge. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, framing these problems sometimes is instant. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think in this case, what people need to understand, the problem we're trying to solve is how do we manage, how do we uh, maintain what is essentially a global infrastructure. Um, you know, biodiversity, our forests, our global infrastructure that support life on this planet. And without, you know, without that infrastructure, none of us will be able to survive. And people don't, people don't necessarily think of nature as infrastructure, but you know, you and I were on a panel yesterday and you said we have to think about it like infrastructure that actually keeps our communities running and keeps us alive, right? Exactly, um, I mean, it's because without it, we won't be able to survive. You know, it's no different than road infrastructure that you can have, water infrastructure that you have, or even telecommunications efficiency infrastructure. But this is the most basic infrastructure that everything builds on. So it's important that we treat it that way and we make investments uh, as if it's something that our lives depend on. It's incredible. Our ecosystems are truly our life systems and healthy uh, healthy nature means, means healthy people. Now, we talked about the fact that much of the world's biodiversity and intact nature is found in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in, in countries like, like Sierra Leone. And we also talked about really what's needed as it relates to investments. Can you talk about sort of your vision 
Sierra Leone's vision for the type of investment that's needed to protect biodiversity? And that's that's really the challenge. The challenge is that most of the assets sit in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Asking the rest of the world, you know, especially the countries in the north, to also do their part because uh, maintaining and restoring these infrastructure is important. What does that look like for you know if, if if countries are going to invest in this in this natural infrastructure in, in when you take care the amount of money that goes into So any interventions that we do have to address their needs. It's they're the ones that are stuck in this future circle. So you yeah. know, for, for us, us these interventions at the local level, uh, we focus on these local communities. How do we get them out of this negative feedback back into a virtual virtual site circle where we then will be custodian for and protect forest and biodiversity? Incredible. I'm so thankful that you stopped by uh, amidst such a busy day to share this perspective. You and I were remarking that all conservation is local, and the work that we're doing in California looks different than the work that's happening in Sierra Leone, but there's a lot uh, a lot we can learn from each other. So I want to thank you for spending time with us, uh, and I know uh, a lot of people that are beaming back from the United States and California are appreciative, and I want to say best of luck for the rest of, of the negotiations. We're really r- ramping up the negotiations. I hear that we'll talk about it a little bit more. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you so much, Secretary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So what a what an honor and a pleasure to have the environment minister with us. Really, the environment ministers are leading their country's delegations, 196 countries strong. In fact, there's only one country that hasn't ratified uh, this treaty on biodiversity. And believe it or not, that's the United States as a result of an inability to ratify environmental treaties in the United States, um, our country is actually not a party to this treaty. But it's important to point out that leaders from the Biden-Harris administration are indeed here and they have been here. Now, my next guest is Renata Gomez. And Renata, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Renata was doing an incredible job facilitating a meeting that I was at yesterday that we're gonna talk about. Uh, Renata is based, I believe in Spain, Uh, working for an organization called Regions 4. And they are really important, bringing together governments like California, state and regional provincial governments, as well as cities uh, who are right in the middle of this fight against climate change and nature loss. So Renata, I want to turn to you, and if you could tell us a little bit more. You know, most of the folks that are joining us here today really probably don't have any idea why 25,000 people have descended here and what's really at stake with the negotiations. So tell us a little bit more about this United Nations process. Well, uh, thank you, Secretary, for inviting me. Uh, I mean, this is uh, this process is fundamental for me. And actually, I believe that this front shows that this is truly a people's front. I mean, you're seeing uh, the green zone is the biggest ever, the biggest, the largest ever. So I think- And the green amazing. zone, tell about what the green zone is. Well, the green zone is amazing. It's actually it's seeing it's exactly what the biodiversity clubs need to bring this message to me. Because this is personal for everyone. I mean, as a mother of a two year old, I, mean, I want my kids to grow listening to bats and listening to the frogs. And the city of Cali is a true testament of biodiversity. I mean, I'm probably you've heard of the frogs just uh, in the streets, they're everywhere. So it's amazing. And, and yeah, so the importance of this, uh, the negotiation processes, and particularly to this club, is to have a privacy. Government to, to implement the decisions that they uh, 
that is the key. So remind us, if you would, what happened in 2022. The along with many decisions that are to implement it and to make the state a So most of the targets are bound to 2030. It's incredible. I want to thank you for your patience and for having technical difficulties. I've got an incredible team here. And what's, um, what I don't think they, that uh, Columbia anticipated was the number of people that were going to be on the Wi-Fi system. So if you could see us now, we've got our colleagues with different cell phones. We're actually zooming in from, from the cell phone. So if you get disrupted for a moment, just just uh, please give us, uh, give us a second if we'll be back on. Um, so Renata, we've heard that, you know, so this is the world coming together, 2022, a big landmark agreement to take a lot of binding actions to protect nature including protecting, conserving almost a third of the earth, 30% of the planet by 2030. We're really proud in California because we've established this roadmap to 30 by 30. And we're actually making progress uh, in supporting our tribal leaders and using this to actually not only protect our nature, but to combat climate change and expand outdoor access. You lead a process of other subnational governments of states and provinces in your words, um, why are why are the actions of our states and provinces around the world important, given that most of the focus of the negotiations is actually between countries? Actually, fundamental is that about 
Yeah, I can I can definitely feel it. And one of the things I love about this uh, is the ability to see and meet people from around the world. I just came from a panel. Uh, we were talking about 30 by 30 and indigenous leadership. And I was up on the panel um, with uh, indigenous leaders from Central America and from Africa, the government officials from South America. I mean, this is truly a coming together of humanity. And Renata, to your point, while the UN is about the member states and nations negotiating, what we realize is to tackle these, these crises like climate change and the nature law, we need everybody to come together. The way I think about it is national leadership is necessary but not adequate. Uh, so huge thanks for your work. I guess maybe last question for you is uh, what gives you hope? You know, we're hearing a lot of disturbing signs about how climate change is accelerating and we're experiencing these in our own lives. Uh, you know, what, what, what gives you hope about uh, uh, an event like this? I'm deeply optimistic because I do see that there's a shift in the relationship. It's not just about climate change. It's not just about climate change. You are seeing climate change. You can see signaling that what is much more at the same time should have better access to the farm that we want to get to the end. So many international leaders, but again, Scott has uh, brought the weapons of the presence of international leaders. Uh, so it's just amazing to know how the strength of international leaders is growing. And I'm inspired by the talks of CPS and the It's amazing. It's really the power of just showing up time and time again, and making your voice loud and well heard, that while we need national leaders, we need a whole lot of other governments. Uh, and in, even in the United States, as we look to such a consequential election in just a week's time, American states uh, will remain leaders on this, uh, regardless of, of whoever our, our president is. And Anna, thank you so much for all that you are doing. Thank you so much. We're going to shift, actually, continents. We've now the Minister of Sierra Leone, an African leader. Uh, we heard Renata Gomez based in Spain, who's organizing the states and provinces. And in a moment, we're going to bring uh, up uh, Mar Marie uh, e uh, Ikimoto. Uh, Marie is the Deputy Secretary of Climate Change and Conservation of Biodiversity uh, in, in the state of, of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we talked uh, a little bit with Renata about uh, these these states that are coming together, and we are on what's called a task force of the high ambition coalition, the states that are most ambitious around nature protection. And I am so excited. Great to see you. We spent we, we spent a lot of time yesterday together. Talk to me about first of all uh, Rio de Janeiro. What what brings you here? I think all of us know Rio as this iconic city that all of us want to visit. But we know less about the state of Rio de Janeiro and your leadership. Usually, people Rio de Janeiro because of because of the samba, the sugar level, the Quisilitina, the beautiful places. But at the same time, Rio de Janeiro protects the rainforest. It's one of the most uh, biodiverse biomes in the world. It's a hot spot. And we are really doing uh, work to protect this. So actually, we joined to the High Ambition Coalition and we are uh, leading this process and we are really much part of that. And uh, we have already 30% of our territory protected by conservation units. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's that we need to celebrate, but at the same time, we know that we need to add this. So, it's just because we are a coastal state, and for that, we announced partnership with the Nature Conservancy to create a conservation for other areas. So, we recognize what we are doing, but you know, we need to. Our missions. We need to do more. So together, together with the Hanbi Coalition, we can 
and be more efficient. We can send a message that we can be That's incredible. And I'll say these partnerships between government and our, our environmental conservation groups are so important. And actually, we in California work with the Nature Conservancy as well. So TNC, as we know, it's one of many environmental conservation groups that is making game-changing difference around the world. And first of all, congratulations that you have already uh, you know, protected 30% of your land, uh, and now your focus is on, on maritime. Uh, same with us. We, we, um, the way we talk about our 30 by 30 progress is about 25% of our land in California is protected durably for environmental benefit. And only about 16% of our of our, our state waters. So we have some work to do there. Um, Marlene, I'm interested in what's your impression? You know, you and I have been in a lot of meetings together this week. You've been in a lot of meetings yourself. What are you what are you finding about this week? What are sort of some key, key points that you would take away from this week? Well, I can say three words uh, um, from this COP. Uh, first, uh, that we really need to integrate integration is key. And then when I say integration, um, I'm saying integration in the different, different levels of governance. So the national, the state, the local level. So we need to work together, and many panels we have discussions about. Um, we have uh, many advances in sub in NBCFs for some countries, but at, at the same time we need to have progress by the subnational governments. And subnational are so important to connect national to local. And when you think about cities, local, where things happen, so that's really important to have this integration and bring the communities together uh, the private sector. So integration is very important. And in our state, we are working hard to uh, strengthen uh, the capacity building of our municipalities because we have so many problems and we have the profit and excellent decisions. So it's not different website. Yeah. So the climate change, uh, the impact of climate change we are missing right now, and that's really threat for biodiversity. Uh, the second is about the climate and biodiversity uh, challenge we need to address. Through. At the same time, we are not suffering uh, the impact of climate change. So the watchwords are integration, connection, Lonely, like we're the only entity getting hit so hard. But one of the power, you know, powerful points of coming here is just to learn how we're all being impacted by climate change. And it's why we're racing so hard to not only protect our people, but bring nature back into balance. Um, I am so glad that we met each other here. Uh, and I am so thankful for your leadership. Next year, we will be uh, together in Brazil. The uh, Conference of Parties on Climate Change will be held in Brazil, and I'm really hopeful that we can come to your state and, and see all that you're, you're doing. Yes, you're invited to, to visit Rio de Janeiro, and it's a big opportunity to Brazil to lead, by example, combating deforestation, increasing restoration. There are our main challenges, so I believe, I hope that we will uh, lead um, with many examples and, and some um, advance in this agenda for the COP30. And well, we see you there. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Incredible leader from the state of Rio de Janeiro, the Deputy Secretary for Climate Change.
I have to say one thing I feel very fortunate about is that the official language for the United Nations is English. And it's so remarkable that so many of our partners, like the Deputy Secretary, uh, are, are engaging with us in this diplomacy in a second or sometimes third language. It's, it's just uh, really remarkable. Um, I want to ask my colleague, Mike, who's holding the phone, to turn around uh, and take a picture of, of, of our friends. We've got, we've got our colleagues holding an umbrella so I don't melt away in the sun. Uh, we've got somebody that's holding the phone in case this one goes. And then we've got some colleagues over here. But you get a sense of this is just one of the plazas um, that's out here. Um, here in the indoor outdoor facility uh, here in, in Cali, Colombia. All right. Um, next up, I want to I want to introduce one of uh, the leaders of our California delegation. So you know we are here on behalf of Governor Newsom and the Newsom administration, but we are joined by over a hundred leaders from California. That include tribal leaders and state legislators. We had a Senator Malik Limon and Ash Kalra and Matt Haney here. We have scientists, academic institutions, educators, youth activists, environmental conservation organizations, and we are making California's voice uh, heard here. It's really, actually really exciting. We get, we're getting sort of um, a lot of laughs from people that say, oh my God, another person from California. But again, that advocacy, you know, we're here to advocate for faster action, to share our model of what we're doing and to learn from others. There's a lot uh, that, we're, that we're actively learning from others. So I want to introduce Cassandra, bring Cassandra Pino uh, here. Uh, Cassandra uh, works for the Native American Land Conservancy. And Cassandra, we're also really psyched that you joined our 30 by 30 partnership committee to really help uh, build out our, our 30 by 30 movement. Uh, so thanks for being here. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us. Um, share a little bit about what brings you here, sort of the work that you do and why you're here. So I'm the policy manager for the Native American Land Conservancy. I work with indigenous communities in Southern California and along with Colorado River. And our organization is always uh, expanding into Northern California as well. Uh, our mission is to preserve, acquire, and protect sacred lands, especially off reservation lands that may be up for um, sale and are properly protected and that maybe have cultural sites and important cultural places on them. So that's the main core of our mission. And I'm really grateful to be here in the beautiful country of Colombia and everything has been wonderful and to you know network with you all and to meet new people all around the world who are in the same sort of um, fight for you know protecting biodiversity in all these different ways and uh, you know all these different facets of this work that requires many different people from many different backgrounds and expertise to work together to solve our climate crisis. That's so. incredible and you know I talk a lot about the journey that we're on and just a few months into becoming governor, uh, Governor Newsom did what no, what no other governor has done, and that is uh, issue a formal apology on behalf of California for uh, over a century of historic wrongs. And that was a powerful, powerful day. But tribal leaders and the governor agreed that um, we needed to actually then listen and learn from, from tribal communities and then act uh, to actually support tribal leaders. And as I've been educated, 80% uh, of the world's biodiversity is actually being managed by indigenous communities. So actually supporting tribal leadership is not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. So Cassandra, when you walk around this conference center, um, you, you visibly see a lot of indigenous leaders from around the world because they're in their traditional garb. I'm just interested as, as an indigenous leader, as a Native American leader doing this work, what's been your impression of, of the indigenous in, in presence uh, and voice here at this conference of parties. Yeah, so it's been really incredible. And there's been so many wonderful speakers from all different nations around the world, um, different indigenous uh, knowledge holders and cultural bearers, uh, elected leaders, as well as folks representing their tribe. Um, I myself am not a tribal leader, but I'm very grateful to be here supporting tribal delegates uh, as they advocate for national monuments in California, including the Satitla National Monument, Chukwala and Quetzal National Monuments. And I think the presence of indigenous people is very strong, but it could definitely be uh, more into the future. And we talked about this yesterday um, amongst ourselves, but we really are inspired by the, you know, the collaboration across countries and across sovereign nations. And we'd like to perhaps support an indigenous delegation from the Northern, um, from North America into the future uh, to get more indigenous leaders, of course, but also folks from indigenous communities, just people who work in cultural departments, youth, 
Uh, we really think it's important that we are here because um, as is known more now, everything that uh, we come from, all of our culture and spirituality and identity is tied to the ecosystems we're from and is tied to the non-human beings that we share space with. Um, and as we mentioned before, there's a lot of healing to be done with uh, colonial governments that have been established in our homelands. And I think that the more that we can establish indigenous presence here, the more that we'll make progress towards addressing um, our biodiversity goals and addressing the climate crisis in a very holistic way that doesn't cause detrimental impacts while we're trying to achieve these goals. And one of the things that I work on a lot with tribes is, you know, this sort of really complex issue of our uh, renewable energy initiatives, especially in the desert. Um, you know, we can't solve our climate crisis by paving the desert over in solar panels and wind farms. And yet we know that solar energy and renewable energy is so important, uh, critical and vital to achieving these goals. So I think that the more that we involve indigenous people in this, uh, in wonderful events like this, and the more that we try and listen to them truly and actually implement their ideas and principles and values into these frameworks and into these targets that are established by coalitions like this, the more we'll realize that there's a way to address um, environmental crises that don't that doesn't harm other communities. And that's really important because, you know, we've, we've already lost so much indigenous people. We are in the midst of a lot of crises of our own in our own communities. And um, I'm really inspired when I'm here because I think that the facts that there might be jobs in the future for indigenous people to be paid to be here and involved in this work, to be funded as representatives and to, you know, collaborate with other nations around the world is so exciting and it's it provides this path of hope for our communities to to be involved in this and to be here and have their voices spoken and be seen and heard um and that in you know on the other side can really help address a lot of detrimental um impacts that have happened to us through colonization through boarding schools um through forced assimilation policies and land theft um and i'm really happy to work with so many wonderful partners like you and everyone here on CNRA staff because I think that you very much understand that and you want to be a partner to tribes in that effort. So um, I think we just keep learning and keep involving Indigenous people more and more because we all will be better for it and it's the right thing to do. Incredible. I'm, I, um, I'm so thankful that you're, you're, you're bringing us home to this critically important point we're here, you know, half a world away in Cali, Colombia, and there's so much work that we need to do in, in what we know as California, actually supporting tribal leadership. I guess last question for you, you know, we have, we have oh, I think almost 250 people that uh, were registered to join us here today, many of whom are not Native American, they're not tribal, but they probably want to be allies. What would you say, what does good allyship look like uh, on these questions? Yeah, that's a really great question. And there's a lot of ways, no matter where you're from or uh, what your job is or what your interests are, that you can support tribal people. Um, a lot of tribes are really invested in land acquisition. So many of them have GoFundMes and uh, tribal communities have GoFundMes for acquiring parcels of land. And sometimes, yeah, it's not 10,000 acres, but just, you know, a couple hundred acres can be very significant for tribal community. So you can donate that way. You can sign petitions and send letters of support to the National Monument Campaign I announced um, today and that the wonderful people I'm here with um, for the Portland Kassan tribe and this uh, um, Pitt River tribe, you can do that. And um, I think also one really great thing I like to do is uh, when I'm talking to folks who are interested in the environment, love going outdoors and who enjoy experiencing the rich biodiversity of California and all around the world is just to really learn about the place you're going and uh, to seek out resources about the original peoples of those places and to sort of look for, you know, signs of ways that education about indigenous people can be improved because there's a lot of misinformation about us out there. There's, um, you know, a lot of things that sort of uh, in our national parks and in our national monuments could be improved in the future to better educate the general public about uh, who we are, where we come from, how our traditional knowledge is uh, so important to preserving biodiversity and how that we've been stewards of these landscapes for thousands and thousands of years. And we're still here. 
we still want to protect these places. And um, I think that while you're protecting us in conservation, also look of how to protect us outside of conservation, support native uh, led policies um, that address all of these different issues we're involved with um, because when indigenous people are healthier, the environment is healthier. So as much as you can help us in all these other ways is uh, beneficial and a way to be a great ally as well. Incredible. Yeah. Cassandra, thank, thank you so, so much for being it. here. Uh, what an what a remarkable kind of inspirational articulation of the role of indigenous leadership here at this conference of parties, but then obviously back home in California. You know, Gita Chandra, who uh, along with James uh, is uh, helping organize this speaker series, does a great job of providing information in the chat. So those of you who are joining, I hope you're following along in the chat and you can find out more about Cassandra's work and the work of the Native American Land Conservancy there. Um, I wanna bring on our last guest and is a colleague and a friend named Tim Mayo. Uh, and Tim leads APIC, which is an organization based in Washington, D.C., that's focused on innovating in environmental conservation. You know, it's interesting. We've talked about the role of governments, of national governments, of states and provinces. Uh, we've talked about the importance of tribal leadership, the role of environmental conservation. But we haven't talked about what private investment can do to help us uh, avert nature loss and, and help get our, our climate um, uh, change under control. So, Tim, I want to invite you up. Um, and, Tim, I, I, I first want to just ask you to share a little bit more about uh, what is EPIC and, you know, why did you why did you brave this uh, humid heat uh, and fly down here from Washington, D.C.? Yeah, we're a, a, a 40 person NGO and our mission is fast. So we care about policies that will lead to faster public health progress, faster environmental progress and private investment can do that when it's built the right way with the right policy framework. Yeah, and you and I have partnered a bunch on our Cutting the Green Tape initiative, which is all about how do we do environmental restoration more quickly and cost effectively. So big thanks there. You know, you have been in the middle of this conversation this week about, about you know, private investment. And I think for some environmental, uh, you know, environmentalists, the idea of private investment into preserving biodiversity feels scary. Because, you know, are we commodifying nature? Are we monetizing nature? But the way I think about it is when we've heard from, for example, the Sierra Leone environment minister on the amount of funding that needs to be invested in protecting this natural infrastructure, uh, you know, we need much more than government can provide. Uh, our companies are large, you know, big international companies are among the biggest players uh, in the global economy. And from my perspective, they should play a role in uh, in protecting nature. So. Talk about that conversation. How would you characterize what's happening here in Colombia? Yeah, I mean, this meeting is would have traditionally been a meeting of environmental people from government and non-government. There are a phenomenal number of kind of Fortune 500 companies here. Um, I heard a stat that more than 10% of, of, uh, of Fortune 500 companies now have a biologist on staff and they're developing biodiversity strategies. Wow. Right? That's a big shift. And not, not just private companies, but think about pension funds, right? Like. The, all the people, many of the people in California, and certainly your whole workforce, has access to pensions. Those pension funds are trying to figure out how to put their assets in things that help the planet while also producing an economic return. So that's the kind of money we're talking about, right? Trillions of dollars, lots of companies trying to do this because they recognize that the planet is really finite. Like everyone can see that at this point. Yeah, and I'm proud of a lot of California based companies that are actually doing this work. I'll, I'll just give you one example. Uh, Apple, which we all know, and, and a lot of our pockets actually, uh, literally in, in our phones and, and, and tablets. Uh, Apple invested in a water restoration project, an environmental restoration project in California with a nonprofit called River Partners. And when I you know, heard about that, I, you know, that to me was a really powerful example of, gosh, how many projects like that could be, could be funded if there are ways for private companies to actually be able to invest. One thing that's been talked about this week is developing something like biodiversity credits, which are a little bit like carbon credits. But I think a lot of people that don't follow this stuff don't even know what it means to have like an environmental credit. So break that down for us and talk a little bit about what's being discussed this week. Yeah. So, I mean, I can make it complicated what is the definition of a biodiversity credit, but it's basically a specific amount of outcome that can be measured and it's based on kind of a theory of change. Um, lots of people are good at creating environmental benefits. We've been doing restoration for hundreds of years, right? So carbon is new. Restoration is not new. Indigenous people have been doing it for thousands of years, right? 
we're actually really good at a lot of restoration. So a biodiversity credit is fundamentally this unit of improvement to nature. And it's set up in a way, for example, with permanent protection of the site where the restoration occurs, a set of metrics to measure different parts of biodiversity, right? So think of bees, butterflies, and maybe the amount of water on a property. And it's got all those components. And it's set up so that a company, uh, either because they're trying to just do good, right? Almost philanthropic, making a contribution. They want to uh, invest in something they know is real, or they're figuring out their supply chain. A great example from a, a major car company that I heard here was they have 15,000 suppliers that provide parts for those cars. There's no way they can figure out what the impact on nature is of 15,000 suppliers, but they want to do something about it. So they're willing to put money, or potentially willing to put money into units that will benefit nature. At its heart, though, they really want to know that they get something. And so a biodiversity credit that says, as nature improved on that site, it's fundamentally about accountability, too. Right? Yeah. The police. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of my colleagues from Catalonia uh, this week really talked about the challenge we have is this is, you know, there's great complexity with this situation around nature loss and how it's impacting both our communities and biodiversity. There's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, how fast the climate change will accelerate. But there's also tremendous urgency, which we know we have to move further faster. So to me, it feels a little bit like a like a no-brainer. We have to figure out a way for companies uh, to actually invest in, in nature because, of course, our, our system, traditionally capitalism, uh, has externalized a lot of these environmental impacts. So, you know, what gives, what's your thought on the path from here? I mean, what, uh, what, what do you take away on this whole discussion of, of private investment and, and maybe biodiversity credits too? Yeah, I mean, let me start with biodiversity credits. Um, there have probably been a hundred panels on biodiversity credits, kind of exceptional interest overflowing in the rooms. I don't think anyone expected that, especially based on the small size of the rooms right. they gave us. Uh, it's just phenomenal interest. And so right now there's projects that are led by indigenous people all around the world. There's projects on private lands, there's some projects on government lands, projects led by the private sector, by, by entrepreneurial startups and by communities. So there's kind of supply. The next step is really, you know, making that demand, uh, putting those pieces together, the private investment and the credits. So, but just based on the level of energy, again, that hundred sessions on, on a subject like this and I'm a total environmental nerd and like what are all these people doing wanting to talk about this uh this subject it's new right that's part of it, it seems new uh, to people so that's part of it but there's there's coming out of this there's going to be a very significant global effort to say we didn't realize that was going to happen we're now going to figure out how to um, how to how to really make sure that there by the time the next stop happens that there's a lot more uh, uh, use of these credits by businesses. And that's incredible. I mean, that's actually a cause for real hope because as we're all talking about, you know, these changes are accelerating and we have nature loss happening across the planet, accelerating climate change. So uh, I love the, I love the mission of your organization, Epic faster. So the faster we can get more funding into in the reversing nature loss, protecting nature, um, the better. I guess last thought just um, off the top of my head, What's been your funnest moment, most fun moment uh, here? Uh, it's a lot of work, but uh, there's also a lot of energy. Yeah, I mean, funnest moment is, uh, uh, is well, let me, there's, there's a couple, but like the, the most fun one was doing a press briefing and basically saying to the reporters, we're not presenting anything, we just want to answer questions. Um, and uh, a reporter standing up and saying, that's great, I'm glad this is a safe space. My question is, uh, because there are these credits in the country of England, is the Bank of England the same as the Environment Bank in England? And it was just like, wow, we really need to start educating at a, at a basic level and think about our language, our terminology, and and really go at people where they, they're at. You are a total environmental nerd, if that yeah. was your fun, funnest thing. But, <laughs> but I love that. No, I love that. And I, and I got to say, um, you know, it's remarkable. Every day, uh, we've been here, I think, five days. This is our last day here. We meet over a hundred people and each of them could actually be part of this discussion. But I really wanted to feature you, Tim, because I think this, I think this discussion around how we actually bring the private sector into these environmental crises and really playing a central role in these, you know, in solving these environmental crises is essential. And I'm really thankful for everything that you do. Yeah. It's great um, to see you here. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. We are, I, we're, I've got just a couple, few more closing thoughts here. Uh, thank you for sticking with us for, for 45, 50 minutes. 
Sorry, we've had technical difficulties. I'm really passionate about sharing what we're doing uh, when we come to these international summits uh, with you. I think that sometimes they can feel really opaque and for people that are back home might say, well, geez, why are you, why are you going halfway across the world? And you know, the, my most powerful answer is that everything that we're experiencing right now in California, whether it's wildfire, worsening drought and flood, extreme heat, is a planetary challenge in nature. We know that the atmosphere is what we all share. And California can be proud of our leadership in so many respects, combating climate change and protecting nature. I couldn't be prouder of this 30 by 30 movement, but if it only happens in California, uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna make the scale of change that we need. And so that's why California comes to these, uh, to, to these convenings. And I'm so proud that we've really diversified our delegation and we have so many different kinds of voices um, in, this, in this work. Uh, we head home tomorrow. I think we're, our team is going to write some, some blogs on this. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna actually share out this recording, uh, it, it'll be available at resources.ca.gov here in the next couple of days. I wanna do something uh, and I wanna bring our team up. Uh, Mike, you can't, you can't come. Well, actually you can, all right, here, come here, come behind me. Um, we have an we have an incredible we have an incredible team here. Um, these are the experts on biodiversity and habitat uh, in our agency, and they've been working their tail off. Uh, so I really want to thank you guys, um, and and uh, just uh, appreciate everybody's uh, interest in what we do. Uh, I want to ask James to bring us to our final slide, and that is with a, an email address. If you have any questions or input on anything we talked about here today or suggestions on future discussions in the Secretary Speaker Series, uh, please do let us know. Um, until we are on together again, take care and we will sign off from Cali, Columbia. <laughs>